Conversation with Ron McLean. Welcome to In Conversation on our Friday, a fabulous duo getting together. Harna Ryan Singh, broadcaster for Hockey Night in Canada, Punjabi edition, and Nick Bonino of the Nashville Predators. Uh, these two men were born 3,000 kilometers apart. Harna Ryan in Brooks, Alberta, and in the case of uh, Nick, it's over in Hartford, Connecticut. That's a long gap between them. But three decades later, they ended up on a stage together. June 15th, 2016, the Pittsburgh Penguins have won the Stanley Cup, and the hero in the city is Harner Ryan Singh. I mean, you cannot make that up. Uh, this is the book. It's called One Game at a Time, and I only have drafts of it, and I'm going to be keen to know how many drafts Harner Ryan did on this uh, fantastic book, The Story of His Life. Uh, but I got to write the foreword for Harner Ryan, which was a tremendous honor. Uh, as you'll discover, uh, his journey is about loving as a boy the game of hockey. It was uh, how he found a way to deal with social, cultural barriers. He loved everything about hockey except one thing, he did not like Mario Lemieux and the Pittsburgh Penguins. And that's the great irony that you can come to love your enemy. And in this case, the man responsible for that little miracle is Nick Bonino. And Nick obviously had two great goals that uh, Harner Ryan described in the Stanley Cup run in 2016. He, he was a phenom in that whole playoff run, was Nick. Uh, but I remember him in 2009 with Boston University Terriers. One of the most incredible stories in hockey happened that year when Miami of Ohio was leading 3-1 to one in the final minute of the championship of the Frozen Four. Nick engineers a goal that cuts it to 3-2, to two, and then he comes on when the goalie goes off, and he engineers, actually scores the tying goal, and the Terriers win in overtime. Amazing. While he was at BU, he met his wife, Lauren, who's from St. Albert, Alberta, Harner Ryan's home province. So, as I say, you can't make this stuff up. It's bound to happen when you found your calling. Play-by-play -play master. Hunter Ryan Singh of Hockey Night in Punjabi. Kementana Samabakia! Kargego! Bandino, 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 Nick! Bandino! We were given such a warm welcome, and especially seeing Mario Lemieux and having him say, you're a part of the Pittsburgh Penguins history. He hugged me and thanked me for the call, and my colleagues and I are just like, is this happening? Benito, 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 Nick Benito! And here they are, united by that magical moment in time. Harner Ryan saying, Nick Benito. Nick, I, I really admire the fact you've done a lot of these interviews uh, with Harner Ryan, and uh, that excites me because it's a great moment for broadcasters. And obviously it's a great moment for you as an athlete, but just, just that connection and why you've been so gracious to, to keep supporting Harner Ryan and, uh, and the miracle of a Punjabi call being what it was. Well, I mean, first and foremost, thanks for having me on. Um, great to be here talking with you guys, but uh, yeah, at, at the end of the day, he's just a great person. You can, you can see it from his broadcasts, from the way he cares about hockey, he cares about me. He introduced me to his family. I uh, met his children after a game in Calgary. So um, I said it, uh, you'll see in his book, he, uh, I told him, thanks for making me famous uh, with that call. I think it kind of blew me up, blew him up. And, uh, you know, it's something that will always connect us. So the book, Harner Ryan, I said I only have drafts of it because I was helping you, of course, with it. And I, we love it. Um, where are you at with it? When will the actual book be available? The book is coming out in the fall, September 22nd, and it's called One Game at a Time. And of course, it was, uh, it's great to have you and Nick uh, read an early copy. But, you know, uh, the message uh, is, is incredible in the sense that for me, this was impossible to be uh, working with you as a colleague, Ron. That was my dream from when I was a kid. But so many people told me that was unrealistic and they tried to caution me to steer me in a different direction. And lo and behold, who would have thought in 2016 I'd be standing on a stage with Nick Benito and the Stanley Cup and to have it all come to fruition and, and all of the challenges and obstacles that came that way. The message from, from the book to kids is don't let, her, don't let anybody ever tell you that something's impossible and be proud of yourself and you know, you'll be able to achieve your, your, your dreams and goals. Nick, what's your story? Uh, you obviously were a great lacrosse, soccer, hockey player. So how did you choose hockey and what were the odds that you would make the National Hockey League? Uh, kind of a long shot. I think my freshman year, uh, I've told this before, I, I wrestled in high school. I was a hundred pound weight class. I was five feet, two inches tall. And um, if you told me, you know, three years from then, I'd, I'd grow eight inches and, and put on 50 pounds, I would have laughed at you. So it's... Uh, it's been a, a fun journey for me. I obviously had great support from my parents and my family growing up. 
I love playing different sports. Like you said, lacrosse, soccer, played everything I could. Um, I think that rounded me out as an athlete. You, you learn, um, you know, when you're on a team, it's a lot different from, from playing tennis, playing golf growing up. I think that that mental aspect of playing an individual sport always helps kind of strengthens your mental side of the game. And, um, you know, as I get up through BU, I kind of realized I was, I was pretty good and, and I had a chance to play professionally. And um, it was a great program to, to hone your skills, to work on what you needed to. For me, it was defensively, just get a little bit stronger, get a little bit better. And, um, you know, drafted by the Sharks way back when. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. Harner Ryan, the, the great irony of this whole thing that you were on stage with the Pittsburgh Penguins, not only that, you were in the dressing room, right? Tell the, tell the viewer about going in before the Cups, uh, the parade, and, and you doing the Bonino call. This is your enemy. This is the team you grew up <laughs> loathing. And Mario Lemieux is the guy you were so mad at as a boy. So tell the viewer all about that. Well, if you grew up in uh, Alberta during the 80s, uh, you know, Gretzky and, and the Flames as well, both fantastic teams winning a ton of Stanley Cups. And, and so there was, uh, there was all of a sudden Mary Lemieux and the Pittsburgh Penguins came on the horizon. And if you're a Gretzky fan uh, in those days, that was not good news because Lemieux was obviously the magnificent one. And uh, so, but we fast forward, as you mentioned, all the way to, 2016 and my hockey cards uh the way I had kind of organized them is I had all my Gretzky cards first and my Lemieux ones at the end and and here we are fast forward to 2016 and uh, the Penguins invite myself and my colleagues from Hockey Night in Canada Punjabi to Pittsburgh for the Stanley Cup parade we have no idea what to expect but what's amazing is is that when we get there before the parade uh, they have us go into the dressing room, but the players, and Nick, you'll be able to talk to this too. I've never actually asked you what you thought at that moment, but the, the PR team from the Penguins, they had us surprise the players. The players are, it was majestic in there. You had um, front and center Sidney Crosby, the Stanley Cups there, the Conn Smythe trophies there, the, the, con the uh, conference trophy is there as well. And you walk in, it's like hockey heaven, but it was such a cool atmosphere because... They had already won the cup a few days ago and the team was getting ready for their Stanley Cup team picture. And when we walked in, everybody was lacing up their skates and it was quiet. And we walked in and I did the Benito call and all of a sudden, all the Penguins players, they just erupted and, and they were cheering. And I remember you, Nick, coming up right away. Crosby came up right away. Your coach, Mike Sullivan at the time. Uh, it was just such a special moment. And, and then that's when we realized how big of a deal this was. It was like, your team, our broadcast was almost like a part of your team. And Mike Sullivan said that he was using our goal calls as a part of uh, your guys' video sessions, which is amazing. So over to you, Nick, your recollection of it all. Yeah, so obviously the call happened. And, uh, and like you say in the book, the first time he did it was against Washington. And I don't think it blew up, but it wasn't as big as it was in the final. And you guys just kept putting out these amazing calls with Bang Bang, Chris Letang, who I actually call Bang Bang if I see him. Um, it just stuck. So he, that's a cool nickname. And uh, yeah, we were in the locker room. Uh, and like you said, it was very quiet. No one had told us you, you guys were coming. And uh, it, it was kind of just little conversations with guys. I think at the time I was bent over tying my skates. We were getting ready to go out for the picture. And I'd, I'd heard the call, you know, probably hundreds of times already. But um, all of a sudden we hear one more time you coming in live. And uh, like you said, the boys were having a great time with it. Everybody loved the call. It was on in our our, um, our pre-scouts, just, just Sully was doing it just to keep us loose, keep us happy. So seeing you do it in person there um, was pretty cool. And then seeing you do it uh, in front of, like you said, 400,000 people, uh, definitely get the chills just thinking about it. It was a really, really cool moment. Harner, Ryan, and Nick, there's a lot of uh, social media questions for you too. And I will ask one uh, that sort of pertains to this, and that is uh, for you, Harner, Ryan, have you a favorite call you've done? Is it Bang Bang Latang or a favorite call you've done besides the Bonino call. That, by uh, the way, well, is from Thomas Bridge. Well, the, um, the Bang Bang Chris Letang was my colleague, Pupinder Hundle, who came up with that one. We have quite a wrestling fan contingent on Hockey Night Punjabi, including our producer, Nathan. Uh, but the other one that I would say that I really enjoyed was, uh, it was during that same year, but Sidney Crosby has scored so many big goals over his career, but it was the first time he'd scored a Stanley Cup uh, playoff overtime winner and you know Sydney uh, grew up with this name Sid the Kid 
And I'm sitting there at that time and I, I'm, you know, it was kind of, it was really a, a moment to reflect too, because the first ever Stanley Cup final that I had been able to call the first year's Hockey Night Punjabi came out was 2008. And that was when the Pittsburgh Penguins were playing the Detroit Red Wings the first time. And they met two years in a row. And, and for me, it was a moment of reflection because it's like, here we are again. But Crosby is a lot older. He's a lot more mature, a lot more, um, more facets to his game, stronger player. And so I was thinking about that just naturally. And then when Crosby scored this overtime game-winning goal, it came to me, Sid, the former kid. And then I let out the Crosby just like I did at the Benito at the very end, the last Benito. Kudli, Shruti, Rusk, Crosby, Mara, Shad, Kita, go! Sid, the former kid, Crosby! So um, that was one that I thought was really cool. And when we were in Pittsburgh at the time, uh, when I had a chance to chat with Sydney uh, and he came up to me and I was about to tell him about that goal call, Sid, the former kid, and he actually finished the sentence off for me and knew all about it and told me it was great. So that was another one that I, that I really enjoyed. Uh, Nick, you know, and I don't have to tell Hunter Ryan this, 2016, your line, Hagelin and Kessel and you, the HBK line, that brought Shawn Michaels, WWE, to, to come to see your games, right? Because he's known by that handle. Uh, wow. I mean, you just, you had such a connection and such a playoffs. Kessel's 22 points. You're second on the team with Malkin at 18. I mean, could you ever imagine on a team with Malkin and Crosby that you, you guys drove the bus? Uh, I, I wouldn't call it driving the bus. I think we, uh, we definitely helped. I think the biggest, one of the biggest reasons was, you know, teams have to uh, watch out for Sid and, and Gino whenever they are. So a lot of times, um, I think by the end of the playoffs, we were getting some tough matchups too, but, you know, especially early on teams are putting their top pair against Sid. You have to, um, no matter how good our line was playing, you're not going to, um, let Sid run free cause he'll, he'll burn you. And, uh, and the same with Gino. So I think, uh, we clicked, we definitely clicked, you know, for me playing with speed on the wings has always been, um, but very important. I think, you know, with my game, just trying to get them to puck and, and you can't get, faster guys than, than Hags and Phil. So um, it was uh, it was kind of a whirlwind. We got we got together with probably 20 years, 20 games left in the year and um, never really had a run like that. It was almost a point of game. And, uh, it was just fun. It was coming to the rink. It's, you know, I guess what, what it feels like for Sid when he just, uh, you know, a point or two a game and uh, and uh, makes it look easy. So I, um, I definitely enjoyed that. It was a lot of fun with those two. And um, you know, still keep in touch with those guys, a couple of great guys. I want to come back to that, just the fact that Mike Sullivan knew you were going. Obviously, the third line's big part of a lot of the Stanley Cups when I think back on my time. Uh, for you, Harner Ryan, uh, you, you wanted to be the broadcaster. You were hosting the NHL awards in your house. You were doing the play-by-play -play in your house and so on. But I think the Tabla story is a great story. Uh, Trilok uh, Gurtu is Jeremy Taggart of Our Lady Pieces Hero, Indian percussionist. Uh, Tabla's as I don't have to tell you, it's like the beaver, the maple leaf, the canoe in Canada. It's you. It's it's who you are. And and you got to perform in front of an audience. And that was your breakthrough, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, since I, I since I was a kid, I've had two passions. And one is Kirtan, and, and that incorporates the instrument tabla, and then one, the other being hockey. And it's it's been, uh, I'm so grateful that I've had both of these dreams come to fruition. And you know, recently, even in India, um, what's considered the Sikh faith's Vatican, the city of Amrits or the Golden Temple. Um, and you and uh, Ron, you and your wife, Carrie, are familiar with the trips to India. Uh, but being able to perform at the Golden Temple and just around the world and then touring with other famous Sikh musicians. Uh, it's, it's incredible because of the fact that um, a lot of people know me as this hockey guy. And then uh, a lot of people know me as this musician. And now just very recently, I've kind of married the two together. Uh, up, up until very recently, I, a lot of, I wasn't actually talking about them together. So even to bring it up here in this interview is really special. It's been, it's been a big part of my life. And, um, you know, the Sikh music, the youth and the tabla, that's something that's, uh, that I'm passing on to my kids as, as well as the hockey. And I'm seeing them grow up. Uh, kind of with those same interests. And it's it's uh, fantastic to see that happening. The principal allowed you to play for the school, right? When you were a boy. And that was kind of a, 
before you know that, Gretzky's one sort of portal, but that was the other, right? That's right. And and you know when you're a kid, I grew up in Brooks, Alberta, so small town in southern Alberta where it wasn't very diverse. And uh, this kid shows up to school in 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 kindergarten, grade one, with a turban. And uh, you know, there's a lot of that in the book too, in terms of just different styles of turbans, in terms of with my classmates, how I was trying to find common ground. And hockey was one of the ways, and then music was the other. And being able, being asked by my uh, my principal and my teacher to perform the tabla in front of the school, that was a breakthrough for me because what it did is it showed me that other people who were, you know, from a different faith or culture or spoke a different language, ate different food, listened to different music. If they were, you know, interested in this Sikh musical instrument, um, that was a breakthrough for me because I realized I could be comfortable in my own skin. So good. Uh, so Nick, Brian Dumoulin ran the room, the music when you were in Pittsburgh, I'll ask you who it is in Nashville. Maybe it's you now. Cause you obviously like when the blues won last year, Gloria was, uh, yeah. was Joel Edmondson was usually with the boom box playing that song after their wins. Who is it in Nashville? Is it you? And uh, tell me about music in your life. Um, it's not me. I am. Um, I, I like music. I like to listen to it, but I've never been a guy before games who's listening to much. I actually, hang out in the training room till about 20, 21 minutes on the clock. I'll run in and get dressed in three or four minutes. It's uh, just kind of do my own thing. I'm out of the, out of the room until then. I think Colton Sissons right now runs it. He does a really good job. It's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of yeah. pressure uh, on the music guy. So Dumo did a really, really good job in pit. Um, Sis does a great job, but uh, you know, there's uh, Joey likes the, the old school. Ryan Johansson likes a lot of that old school rock. Uh, he'll yeah. always put that on. Um, and sis, we, we have pretty much everything, uh, a mix of everything when sis does it. So, um, we haven't heard any, uh, any tabla yet. I, I, yeah. I actually haven't heard of anything. I, I know I read it in, uh, read it in the book. So I'd, uh, I definitely love to, to see a clip of that. Cause it definitely sounds interesting. Okay. I will forget about your t-shirt and I don't want to forget about your t-shirt because this is a lovely connection. Alberta can take great pride in uh, Harner Ryan, but they can take great pride at the, Fastest line would have been Kessel, Hagelin, and Lauren, your wife, had she been in the middle instead of you, right? <laughs> Tell us about your shirt first and then Lauren's roots. Yeah, I just have a uh, fire rescue Edmonton, Lauren. Uh, my wife is from St. Albert, and uh, she has uh, three brothers, and two of them are, are on the fire department there. So on the front lines during this whole thing, uh, they've, been, they've been on the fire department for a while, over a decade, I think, now. And, uh, our sister-in-law there also, so her third brother lives there, his wife. Uh, as a doctor so her whole family is um is there uh, on the front lines we have so much respect for everybody in the world who's doing this and uh you know having it in the family um just gives you an appreciation of how hard it is how, how tough the times are so wanted to uh wear this shirt and um just thank them thank everyone who's out there uh keeping everybody as safe as they can such a great uh, connection to Chris Joseph, too. You know, played in the National Hockey League and is now a firefighter and lost his boy Jackson. St. Albert was really hit hard by the Humboldt Bronco bus tragedy. So that's a that's a beautiful symbol that you have there. Harner Ryan, I, you know, your calls of Benino in 2016 are iconic. I would have loved to have you call 2009 the Frozen Four final. So Boston University, Nick, you got to tell this story. Uh, it's one of the greatest games I've ever watched. You're down three to one to poor uh, Enrico Blasi's, because uh, I used to referee Enrico when he played Wexford Raiders. They're leading three to one. They're going to win the Frozen Four, and uh, that's Miami of Ohio. And then what happens? What do the Terriers do about three to one trailing in the final minute? Uh, it's hard to hard to believe, but we did. We somehow came back and won that game. We uh, we were you know the consensus number one team in the nation the whole year. We won everything we played for every tournament. Um, we got there, we were the one seed. We had, you know, all six defensemen on that team played in the NHL, handful of forwards played in the NHL. We were loaded and we came up against a, uh, really upstart Miami, Ohio team, uh, played so hard and, and we're down three to one in the, in the finals with a minute left. And, um, if you haven't seen it, uh, I'd, I'd tell people to watch it. It's, uh, just, mm. you know, it doesn't matter who you're a fan of. It's just a great sports moment I, on our end, at least, uh, for how it turned out, but I managed to score two goals in the last minute. And over time, uh, Colby Cohen with a, a fluky clapper that went over the goalie and, um, and that was it. So it was one of those games that I, I told you before we started, uh, started the interview. I, I still can't believe when you're watching the highlights, you can't believe we actually pulled it off, but, uh, 
we had a really good team, made some really, really calm plays, some collected plays out there and, and were able to get it done. So definitely watch that if you haven't seen it. Yeah, you came in off the bench uh, when the goalie's out, 17 seconds left, Nick tied it, Harner Ryan, and uh, he was incredible. That, that, is, that is just a magical moment. So glad we can draw everyone's attention to that. Uh, in your case, Harner Ryan, you know, you've, you've hobnobbed now with Wayne Gretzky. Just tell uh, you and your sister and the, the way you would uh, find a way to get to Gretzky is just, again, in the book, it's magic. Go on about that. Yeah, we were pretty uh, obsessed to say the least. And, uh, you know, anytime Gretzky was, uh, as we were growing up, we would find ways to skip school and try to go to watch practice. And I, I mean, especially um, later on towards the end of his career. And, you know, it's funny when we were growing up, like my bedroom was an absolute shrine for Gretzky. And we just, when he got, when he moved from the Oilers, everything changed to the Kings. When he moved from the Kings, it changed to the Blues and then eventually the Rangers. And then I remember in 99 when it was his last uh, season and everybody knew he was going to retire. And uh, his last game that he played in Calgary against the Flames, we just knew we had to be there. Figured out tickets, went, to, you know, got permission from my parents who were teachers to skip school. And they gave us the blessing and drove from we drove from Brooks to Calgary for that. And, uh, you know, figuring out which hotel he was staying at and, and calling all sorts of different hotels and then, and then uh, arriving there and just, you know, special moments where we were, we had a uh, number 99 greatest of all time sign. And, you know, he saw us and waved. And then we later on uh, when he had, when he retired and he had charity golf tournaments, uh, just the way that we were able to find this connection. Um, and I'm a talker, of course, and that fits uh, well with being a commentator it's hard to have me shut up as you can tell from this interview but um just having a moment with Gretzky at one charity golf tournament where we started talking to him and telling him stories about how we used to pray for him and make Prashad at home for him as a family on his birthday on January 26th and then got a picture with him in the year after at another charity golf tournament he we saw him again and he remembered us and he signed we had the picture and he signed that picture and we got another one and it was just incredible. And now as a broadcaster to be able to meet him um, in Los Angeles at the NHL 100 and then um, now uh, as, a, as a host for Sportsnet, just being able to chat with him. He's, he's everything as advertised, so genuine, so humble. And all of those characteristics that Wayne Gretzky has are those things that I was learning from my Sikh faith about being, uh, about having humility and about giving back to your community. And that's why I, I began to, you know, um, admire him so much, not just as a hockey player, but as, as who he is as an individual. Hey, Harner Ryan, just a serious one. Because of George Floyd, because of what's going on in Minneapolis, uh, you, you're such an advocate for uh, dealing with social cultural uh, acceptance. You know, nothing's going to change if we don't face it. Um, what, what, what's kind of been in your head? Uh, what have you been reflecting on and how would you, because it's always hard to teach uh, to enlighten without offending. And I'm sure, you know, we've talked about this a lot. What, where are you at right now thinking about that? It's difficult because, um, as you and I have talked about uh, in depth, Ron, I really thought as, as a society, we had made a lot of progress. And, you know, from when I grew up um, in, in my high school days and then becoming a broadcaster, there was a stretch of time where I thought things are getting a lot better. And then now recently in the last few years, it seems like we've taken a lot of steps backwards. And it's really... It's scary to see um, not only what's going on in the States, you mentioned uh, George Floyd, but also just in Canada, I guess I was, I was trying to ignore the fact that racism and discrimination still exists here because I've been such an advocate and so patriotic about what Canada stands for and the multiculturalism and how it works here. Uh, but there is a lot, there is this still the sentiment out there that if you're different, you don't belong. And, and that's what's scary. And I think, and I applaud you for even bringing this up in this interview, because we have to have talk about it. We have to face it, as you mentioned, and that's the only way we're going to spread a message of positivity and love for humanity, despite our differences. And so these conversations need to happen. Um, but, you know, I still have hope, but it is also frightening and frustrating to see what's going on um, in the world a lot, especially in the last uh, few years. 
I remember uh, James Baldwin wrote a uh, next fire in 1963. He said, uh, that uh, the greatest uh, crime is innocence. Uh, and, and so we're in a real period now. And uh, Nick, I don't mean to put you on the spot because uh, you're a hockey player and you know what will happen to you on social media if you say anything. Uh, but still, you and Lauren are obviously, uh, you know, at university uh, friends, uh, you would have talked about ethics and you've been very good about the COVID-19 and thoughts. You want to chime in on that at all? I can protect you. But if you have a feeling about what it's like to, to see what's happening in Minneapolis take place. Yeah, it's... Uh... I mean, just watching the video um, that started it all with George Floyd, it, uh, you're shaking with rage. You're, um, it's, it's horrific. So um, I think Harner Ryan said it perfectly. Um, like you said, I don't you know, feel like I need to, to comment too much. I think um, you know, my family is, is sickened by it. We, you know, just racism is, is terrible. It, it sh it's something that sadly does exist, but, uh, you know, any strides we can make to, to, to stopping it. Uh, and I think one of those strides is, is the book Harner Ryan wrote it, uh, you know, it, it has so many good points. The message is amazing. And, um, you know, it's something that I, I really encourage people to read because it's, it's somebody in the hockey world who has dealt with that from the time he was in kindergarten and, um, you know, how he's handled that and how he advocates um, is something really special. So uh, I guess that's my comment on it. It's fantastic, Nick. And 9-11, and right? You read it, Nick. Uh, when, when Harner Ryan had to, I mean, I think, uh, you know, China is, is obviously a, a very difficult time uh, to be Chinese in our country. Uh, and you experienced it uh, with 9-11, Harner Ryan. Go on about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, it's crazy because you have New York City and then you have Brooks, Alberta, and you, you think, what's the connection? And, and, and you know, I'm in high school uh, on the day of 9-11, uh, and in my high school, I have gone to school with most of these classmates and students in Brooks uh, since I was in kindergarten. Like, the majority of us grew up together, so, you know, there's... Uh, there's no kind of secrets. We all know each other fairly well. And um, I'm walking in, a, in the hallway, I left classroom. All of us were watching what was going on on the news. The teachers had brought in all of the, the monitors. And um, a, a friend who played hockey and we bonded over hockey and I'd known him since I was very young uh, and in kindergarten. And uh, he all of a sudden grabbed me by the throat and threw me up against the wall. And he was bigger and stronger than I was. And uh, as he's holding me by the throat, I didn't have the playoff beard at that time. So as he's holding me by the throat um, and, you know, choking me, he's saying all sorts of um, obscenities and saying, you know, go back to where you came from. I can't believe you guys did this and all and just making this assumption that, myself or my community or who I am, I have some sort of association with what happened in New York City on that tragic day. And uh, I'm trying to get him off me and I'm trying to say, hey, I've known you my whole entire life. Our families know each other. What are you talking about? I have nothing to do with this. And I finally got him off. But um, it, it was a really big eye opener for me that on, on the flip of a switch, someone who I've known for almost you know, over a decade uh, sees something, sees images on TV and makes this assumption because, you know, he's got a turban or, you know, there's this association there. And that made me really realize that I had to be a lot more careful because this was just Brooks, Alberta. But when I graduated and went on with my life in the world, um, I had to be conscious of that. And for many years after myself, my, the entire community, we really had to be cognizant of, of those assumptions that people make. And so, um, yeah, traumatic experience, something that I, I even remember uh, Gary Bettman um, and I were chatting one day and he read this in the Players Tribune and he brought it up as well because he's from New York too. And it, it's, it's a moment that, um, that really makes you reflect and realize that we have a long ways to go. Yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, let's end with a little bit of hockey. Let me, let me give you a, a social media question, Nick. I put you on the spot again here, but uh, you pick a number between one and three, and I'll ask you a question. Two. Two. The question is, uh, what's your favorite memory of Vancouver? This is Owen Smith, number nine. What is your favorite memory of playing in Vancouver? 
Oh, no. uh, I love Vancouver. What a city. Um, you know, a place with uh, a great team in place already, you know, with the twins there. Um, being able to play with them, just two legends, two great guys, some of the best guys I've ever met. Um, you know, the playoffs there stand out to me um, because it was uh, just being on a Canadian team in the playoffs was, was pretty special. The, the city was buzzing. We were playing um, another Canadian team in Calgary, and uh, it seemed like the spotlight was just, just on that in the hockey world, especially in Canada. So uh, the playoffs stand out. It didn't go the way we wanted to, but, uh, but the fans there are very passionate. They want a winning team, and, uh, and I really enjoyed playing in front of them. So I, I'll always remember the playoffs there. Um, it, just a really, a really fun year for me. Uh, when you think about coming back and playing this year, I've been trying to figure out it could be the younger team has an edge because you got to play a, a round before the three or the four rounds, I should say. Uh, it could be the goalie, but I think a coach might make a difference more so because they got four months to make a game plan. <laughs> so yeah. all these all these teams, right, with uh, Jack Adams trophy winners, like uh, could be a, guy, a, a sort of guy like Jacques Martin, Pittsburgh. You know, who knows? Do you think that's going to be a factor? What do you think is going to be the factor? Yeah, I think rest will obviously be a factor, like you said, younger teams, but I think it really can benefit a little bit of older teams too, who have a chance to, you know, all us guys over 30, uh, rest our, uh, our aching bones and, uh, and gear up for the playoffs. So we, um, we, like you said, our coaches have, have been so prepared throughout the regular season when they have 12 hours. I, I, I'm imagining with three to four months, they'd, uh, they'll have all our game plans ready. They know our opponent if we are to come back in Arizona. So, uh, the video will be ready. There's no excuse there for us. I think it'll just be, you know, making sure we've all done our part to stay in shape, which, you know, talking to our team, it seems like we have. It seems like uh, everybody's kind of dialed in on that. So if, if we do come back here in the next uh, couple months, hopefully we'll be uh, as ready as anybody. Well, you got to start working on your playoff beard, though, Nick. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I, yeah. I saw yours. I knew I could never, I could never get there. So, uh, <laughs> so I cut it now. It's, uh, yours was pretty forever. good. Yours was pretty good back in the day in the Pittsburgh days. It was good. I think uh, Lauren kind of called that, uh, told me that was done. There'd be, you know, I'd catch some food in it now and then. It'd uh, be scratching me. I'd be always itching it. So, um, you know, it's amazing you're able to, to, to deliver with it. It's, pretty, um, it's a pretty impressive beard. I wish, uh, I wish I could grow it out, but I think those days are done for me. Well, we're all going to have beards if we keep this thing going. So let's <laughs> stop it right there. But uh, thank you, Harner Ryan. Thank you, Nick. Just such a treat. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ron. Benino, Benino, Benino forever. Harner Ryan Singh and Nick Benino, our gratitude. That was just fantastic. We're back Monday, 7 o'clock Eastern, 4 Pacific. We always close with a song lyric. And since we have Hockey Net in Canada, Punjabi, we'll go with a Punjabi rap sensation. If they're talking behind your back, it means you are ahead of them. That's Sidhu Moose Walla. That's our show. Thanks for watching. So long.